welcome to Jesus School. All right, we'll be in Matthew chapter 18 and looking at a couple verses, verses 21 and 22. We'll look at some verses before and after at some point, but we'll start out with these verses here, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Uh, we're going to talk about forgiveness today. Jesus is talking about forgiveness, and we're going to echo those truths that he gives us. I think forgiveness is one of the hardest things we can do, but is a necessary part of our life, is a necessary part of our sanctification process, is a necessary part of being a follower of Jesus. So, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? If only, Peter. <laughs> no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Wow. Uh, why did Peter suggest seven times? Well, some say that it was tradition in the day, you know, three times. Three, three times and you're good. After that, you're off the hook. Don't have to forgive him anymore. Uh, maybe based on passages in the Old Testament, like in Amos. Uh, so Peter may have thought he was going the extra mile. Um, some say, depending on where you believe chronologically, that maybe it could be a call to Luke 17, where Jesus says, if someone sins against you seven times in a day, uh, then you forgive him each time. And so maybe, I'm a good student, you know, again. But really and truly, it doesn't matter why Peter said it seven times. Uh, whatever the reason, Jesus was sure to let him know that's not enough. <laughs> in fact, it's not nearly enough. The point was this. Throughout our life, we are going to encounter people and circumstances where we will be wronged. This will happen many times because we live in a fallen world which is inhabited by sinners, including us. Our one and only option in those circumstances, our mandate given by King Jesus, is to forgive. It is not an option that Jesus gives us, but a mandate, a command. He says, forgive. Father, I pray that the spirit of forgiveness would rest on each and every one of us here today. I pray that we would grow deeper, that our roots would grow deep into your love. I pray that we would love from a heart that is loved. I pray that we would forgive from a heart that's been forgiven. And I pray that we would see others through redeemed eyes that Jesus gives us. We love you, Lord. Help us fall more in love with you today. Amen. Maybe you've been hurt. I think we could probably just remove the maybe. <laughs> There's been times in our life where we have been hurt. It's some significant, some maybe lesser significance, but nonetheless, pain is still real. Maybe it was a conversation that stunned you, a shocking discovery. Maybe it was the day a friend walked away, a betrayal. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was manipulation, violence, abuse. But regardless, it was a day where something changed. A wound was formed and hurt followed. If that's you, which I believe that's been all of us at some point in life, if no one else has said this to you yet, I am so, so sorry for all that's happened. We recognize that pain, right? Whether this was a collection of events or maybe a singular event because somebody wasn't who they were supposed to be or didn't do what they were supposed to do or didn't protect like they were supposed to protect. We take this moment and acknowledge that it is real and that it hurts. But we can also acknowledge the fact that we can't stay there. We can't stay in that place of hurt. It doesn't mean that the hurt isn't there, but it means that 
we need to give Jesus the opportunity to heal it and to allow us to recover in greater measure. So we understand enough pain has been caused. No reason to continue to allow that pain to fester. We get to decide how we are going to move forward. And that's the beautiful thing about this. And the way to move forward past these hurts is a simple yet difficult thing called forgiveness. Let's look at two definitions for forgiveness. Okay, we'll look at a practical definition and a biblical definition. So practical definition. To cease to feel resentment against an offender to give up resentment of or claim to requital or retaliation. Biblical definition, that word forgive, to send forth, lay aside, omit, leave, or send away. You may think of the circumstance in your life or collection of events in your life and you see or read or hear Jesus' command, forgive, forgive them. And maybe as you see those words and hear those words, maybe you feel like the disciples who are sitting there looking across 5,000 plus people, and Jesus looks directly at them and says, feed them. Feed them? (laughs) How? There's so many. And maybe you look at the collection of hurts or the hurt in your life, and Jesus says, forgive them. And you say, how? There's so many. Just as Jesus was faithful to help them feed the 5,000, Jesus will be faithful in helping you walk out forgiveness. We choose forgiveness uh, when we do, we are, we are choosing holiness, right? We understand, we've talked about this in our holiness series uh, some time back. Forgiveness or, or uh, sanctification or holiness is a process, and it also can happen through encounter, and it's beautiful. There are moments where uh, we have this holiness encounter, this sanctification encounter where Jesus comes, meets us where we're at, breaks things off of our life, and we just experience freedom and holiness in a new way because of this encounter that we just had with Jesus. And we also know in sanctification, in this uh, life that we live, it is also a process. It is a dying daily. It is a daily commitment to walking out the sanctification that the Lord has called us to. I believe forgiveness works a lot the same. There can be forgiveness encounters that we can have where Jesus, in a moment, can pull out roots that have been there for so long. And Jesus can can allow this amazing love to fill our hearts. And it seems like in a moment we had this forgiveness encounter. And yet forgiveness can also be a daily or continual decision this process of walking it out, and it's beautiful. What does true or pure forgiveness look like, right? So if I'm going to uh, look at how to do something, I'm going to try to find somebody who is a master at it, right? So if I'm going to uh, find, if I'm going to figure out, okay, I want to build a house, okay? Um, I'm probably not going to go to somebody who's never built a house before. I'm probably not going to go to somebody who took a class at Home Depot one time. This is probably not going to happen, all right, for illustration's sake and in my mind's sake. I'm going to go to Chad and say, Chad, how do I build a house? I finally got those two-by-fours in my truck. Now, how do I build this house, right? I'm going to go to someone that is a master house builder, okay? If I'm going to figure out, you know what, my grilling skills have been lacking lately. Paul, you already know I'm coming to you. All right, Paul, help me. How do I season this? How do I do this? How long do I grill this for? I am determined I would eat anything Paul makes. Uh, There is no doubt. I would go to a master griller, okay? So if I'm going to look at forgiveness, 
I'm going to look at the master forgiver, right? And of course, we know Jesus is our model. We're going to look at a couple scriptures here. Um, but obviously, the first one that comes to mind is as Jesus is on the cross. Oh, what a, what a moment of forgiveness. In the midst of his suffering and crucifixion, he says, Father, forgive them. Oof, that is tough. Now, maybe we can pat ourselves on the back after a situation has happened and we go back and we pray and Lord gives us strength and we forgive and, ooh, okay. But in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the hurt and the offense, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Psalm 103.12 says this, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Isaiah says this, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Micah says this, Where is another God like you? who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people. You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love, mercy. Once again, you will have compassion on us all. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. When you read those and you hear those and you think of these stories, it makes forgiveness sound so good. Until then, it's your turn to forgive. Oh, then it becomes harder. What is forgiveness? Being aware of what someone has done and still choosing to forgive. Choosing to keep no record of wrongs and relinquishing the right to get even or take revenge. I think we could sum those up based on those passages we read. So we've looked at what forgiveness is. Let's take a minute and look at what forgiveness is not. As I was studying through forgiveness, I think studying what forgiveness is not was super helpful for me. Forgiveness is something I know we can hear often and uh, learn about and understand. It's one of those things like, I know, I know I'm supposed to do it, (laughs) right? But let's take a look at what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not approval of what they did. It is not saying that what they did was okay, because it wasn't. We are not saying that there are no consequences for the action. There will be. We're not saying vengeance is not due. It is. What we are saying is that vengeance is God's and not ours. We are allowing him to be the righteous judge and taking ourselves out of that seat that is only for God. None of us can judge righteously like he can. And so we leave it to him. Forgiveness is not excusing of what they did. While it does help us to understand people, right? That can bring compassion. It also doesn't mean we excuse it. I can't think of how many times in the Rafa rooms that we have, right? Sometimes it's hard to get to forgiveness because of this right here. Well, I don't need to forgive him or I already have forgiven him. No, no, no. What actually it is, is you're just excusing what they did. Well, they had a rough life when they were younger, and their parents were, you know, unkind, and whatever the situation is for them, and so it's okay. No, 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 it's not okay, and no, we're not excusing what they did. We have to look past that and understand wrong was done, and forgiveness is needed. Forgiveness is not justifying what they did. It's not justifying. God doesn't call evil good. Forgiveness is not denying what they did, right? Uh, Oftentimes, this is done unconsciously, subconsciously, suppressing what we feel inside or just living in denial that something didn't actually happen. 
While it is hard to face the facts, and pain is tough as you enter into that, I don't want to deal with that, so I, you know what? I don't think it happened. That's not the road to forgiveness. Suppressing things, pushing them down, never heals the wound. Forgiveness is not blindness to what happened. This is a conscious choice to pretend that a sin did not take place. Don't do that. And here's why. And here's why I can't do this. It cheapens forgiveness. If I am acting like it never happened, it's just something that uh, never took place, that cheapens what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is choosing to see that wrong was done and then extending that hand of forgiveness. So when we act like it never happened, we're trying to cheapen what forgiveness is. Jesus did not pretend that our sins never happened. They did happen. He extended forgiveness, died on the cross, took our punishment, and extended his hand of forgiveness towards us. Forgiveness is not refusing to take the wrong seriously. We can't truly forgive until we really understand the seriousness of what it is. Right? And that's hard even in our own lives when we think of forgiveness to God and we ask for forgiveness. Um, there has to come this moment of realization, my sin is bad. We're great at justifying our sin. I know I am. <laughs> We're great at justifying. Well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, at least it wasn't. Never thought that, said that. Oof. And Jesus says it, it was that bad. But I'm willing to forgive. And so it comes a moment where we have to take the wrong seriously in our own lives and in the lives of others. Forgiveness is not pretending we are not hurt. Acknowledging the hurt and pain is oftentimes the first step on this road to healing. We can't just pretend it's not there, right? Well, I'm tough. I'm strong. It didn't affect me that much. Not a big deal. It is a big deal. It did affect you that much. And that's part of, part of the problem, part of why we're at where we're at right now, right? It's understanding I was hurt. We acknowledge those hurts and we go along with it. Okay, ooh, here's the next one. Ooh. Forgiveness is not a philosophy. Forgiveness is not a philosophy. I can convince myself that I have forgiven somebody. But if my behavior has not changed, have I forgiven that person fully? Right? If it doesn't affect my behavior, it's just a philosophy. So if you have this question, I believe I've forgiven this person. Okay, great. Here's the next question we then ask. What fruit of forgiveness is showing in my life? Where is the fruit that follows this decision? Okay. Forgiveness is not, last one, reconciliation. Reconciliation is wonderful and beautiful, and we're going to talk about it here in just a moment, but reconciliation and forgiveness are not equal. Those are not the same things. Reconciliation means to restore to friendship or harmony, settle, resolve. While you, uh, <laughs> as far as this goes, you won't get reconciliation without forgiveness, it is important to understand they're not the same thing. One of them, right, so the other party does not need to apologize, confess, put sackcloth and ashes on, come before you on their knees, right, and say, I was wrong. That's not needed for forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice regardless of how they act. But reconciliation involves participation from both parties, okay? I like to think of it like this. If I have a bike, one of my favorite things I like doing uh, that we've figured out in recent years is just going on a bike ride with my wife. I love doing that. It's, it's relaxing, it's enjoyable, 
It's like a little date. It's wonderful. And the kids can't keep up, so it's even better. Uh, it's great. Um, but I love it. So reconciliation is like a bicycle, a bike. A bike takes two tires to work properly, to work in the way that it's supposed to, right? So, so does reconciliation. Now, when it comes to this reconciliation, I get to bring a tire to this bike. The tire that I get to bring is my forgiveness, and it's my willingness and my part in getting this reconciliation going, okay? I'm not going to ride a bicycle with one tire. That's not gonna happen, <laughs> okay? Yeah, it's cool to do a wheelie, all right? That's cool. But it's exhausting, it's not sustainable, it's unwise, and it's dangerous. And so a trap, and I had, man, whew, Lord was dealing with me on this one. A trap that we can have is this idea of reconciliation means I'm riding around on one wheel because I'm trying to do the part of two people. And you can't when it comes to reconciliation. There has to be participation from the other person. In fact, Jesus even talks about this in this passage, right? So, Peter has this exchange with Jesus, Lord, how often shall I forgive? And Jesus tells him a lot, way more than that, Peter. What precedes that conversation is this right here. He says, Jesus does, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Yes, let's go. Sounds a lot like reconciliation. But, if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. What is Jesus teaching us in this passage? Jesus, I believe, is teaching us about reconciliation, and about healthy boundaries. When he says, treat them as a pagan or tax collector, he's not saying, shun them, treat them with contempt. Just think about it. Jesus ate with tax collectors and publicans and sinners. And all. Jesus ate with those type of people. But it does mean there's a change in the relationship. It is no longer this close, intimate fellowship of a brother or sister in Christ, but now... I must understand that there is less influence and less intimacy in the relationship than there was before. Boundaries are not something that we should shy away from or feel guilty of when it comes to this road of reconciliation. Because when you empty all of your emotional, physical, financial, or relational resources to help somebody else in this relationship that doesn't want to be helped or doesn't want it to be fixed, you're going to find yourself frustrated at best, devastated at worst. What happens is we take on the role, again, right? We talk about bitterness and forgiveness, taking on the role of judge and realizing, I can't take that role. That's Jesus's role. And in this case, we can take on the role of savior. Well, it's my job to save this relationship, right? And in many times we can see that in our lives. We see a relationship that's hurting or fractured or broken. And many times we say, ooh, I don't like that. I want that to be fixed. Of course, that's a good desire. That's a desire implanted in us from the Lord. Restoration, reconciliation. However, my job is not to be savior of the relationship. When I'm savior of the relationship, I'm riding a bicycle that's supposed to have two wheels, all right? No, no cheating the illustration, not a unicycle. That's different, okay? But a bicycle that's supposed to have two wheels, I'm now riding with one. It's not healthy. And it's not wise. That's not our job. That's Jesus's job. And so there comes a point oftentimes in a relationship where we have to say, you know what? 
I am releasing this person to the consequences of their own actions. Not in an unkind way. In fact, oftentimes that's one of the hardest steps. It's because we care so much about the person and the relationship. But, as you know, if, I talked about uh, Chad earlier, if Chad's going to teach Joshua how to build a house, Chad is not going to do everything for Joshua. Joshua can learn visually, but that's not going to be nearly as effective as Chad saying, okay, now here's how you hold the nail, here's how you hold the hammer, do it. And then he learns by doing it, right? In our relationships, we can't hold the other person's hand the whole time. There has to come a point where they have to be willing. Now, now, while forgiveness is a command and reconciliation relies on the actions of both parties, right, we are still told this in Romans 12. If possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. So it's not a get out of jail free card. Well, I forgive and oh, they don't want to be reconciled. Woo, good, because I didn't want it either. Okay. Uh, no, 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 that's not how that works. <laughs> if that possible, that does mean sometimes it may not be. As far as depends on you, as far as depends on me. That shows me I have to make sure I am bringing my part to reconciliation. I can't just say, well, forgiveness is it. That's it. No, 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 no. Forgiveness and the willingness to say, well, let's be reconciled. Now, does that mean things have to go the exact way they were before? No, no. Does it mean you have to go on vacation with this person? <laughs> also no, Okay. Unless it's like whitewater rafting. and you No, 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 that's terrible. That's counterproductive. Think about this in 2 Corinthians. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That reconciliation, that, that message and ministry of reconciliation that we are to bring to others can ring pretty hollow if we are not living out a life of reconciliation, right? We can convince ourselves that reconciliation or forgiveness has happened, but then let's ask this question, right? We ask the question of what fruit is there in our forgiveness? Let's ask this question as well. Do I have any desire for any form of reconciliation? Now, again, does that mean things have to go back to the exact way they were before? No. Healthy boundaries, okay? Does that mean it has to look like? No, no, no. It means, is there any form? How is my heart posture when it comes to forgiveness and reconciliation? Okay? Why should we forgive? Why should we forgive? Jesus talks about that as well. He gives this parable of this man, and of course, we know the story. He, uh, this man owes millions, if you will, according to the NLT, millions of dollars uh, to this man, to this leader, to this authority. And the, man, the, the authority comes and says, I'm here to collect the debt. You owe millions of dollars. Let's see it, buddy. <laughs> okay? And he says, I don't have it. I don't have it, uh, but give me time and I'll pay it. Come on. Give me time and I'll pay you back millions of dollars. This is like lifetime's worth of, <laughs> of, of money here. But the king or, or the authority has compassion and mercy on the man and says, you're forgiven. And so what happens? The man goes away to the next person, one of uh, the creditors underneath him, and the Bible says grabs him by the throat. 
all right? We've got a nice visual image there. Grabs him by the throat and says, pay me back. Millions of dollars, unpayable debt. This man owed a couple thousand dollars. That's a lot. Let's, let's take a minute and say, that's still a lot of money. If somebody owes you five bucks, eh, somebody owes you a couple thousand dollars, you know. <laughs> All right? There's no wondering if they owe you money, you know? Uh, did Josh pay me back, you know, for Chipotle the other day? Uh, you know, I may forget that. Did Josh pay me back for that car the other day? I'm going to remember that one, okay? So it is a debt, but here's the point. The man was just forgiven of a debt he could never have paid, millions. And he takes him, and he says, okay, you can't pay? The man says, give me more time. You, he could pay this debt with more time. He says, no, throws him into prison. Of course, we know the story. The, the man over the creditor comes, comes back, right, from, from the grapevine he hears and comes and says, hey, 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 what are you doing? I just showed you incredible mercy and you couldn't show it for them? The Bible says he takes him and throws him to the tormentors. He gets put into this prison. So we know there are consequences of withholding forgiveness and benefits of extending it. What are some consequences? Well, number one, withheld forgiveness, right? Jesus says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That sounds like a lot of motivation to forgive other people. Doesn't that sound a little self-serving? Sure, but Jesus said it, <laughs> so it's okay to do. Number two, consequence of unforgiveness or withholding forgiveness, grieving of the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What's the very next sentence? Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, malice. Get rid of all of that, right? It, it grieves the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Maybe that means dampened fellowship with our Savior, that, that relationship isn't the same. Maybe it means diminished anointing. Not gone, but diminished. Mm. Consequence, opening a door to the enemy. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity, give no foothold, give no place to the devil. Uh, I was working with um, somebody walking them through crippling fear that they had. When I say crippling fear, I mean it was just, it was crippling. It affected them in a multitude of ways in their life. Anxiety and fear. So as we began to walk through this, we found there was a source memory and an event that happened from people who caused this fear in their life. Okay. So we get into that memory. We get to the part where it's time to now forgive and bless those that caused this major fear. And as this person started to speak out those words, right? At first they couldn't. It was like, like they couldn't get the words out of their throat. And finally they broke through and did and started shaking and crying uncontrollably. Just happened in a moment, just uncontrollably. What had happened? happened is unforgiveness or bitterness had a place, had a foothold, had an opportunity to continue to torment them with this fear. Once forgiveness took place, the enemy was quickly kicked out. Forgiveness allows that to happen. Unforgiveness, what's the consequence? Allowing bitterness to grow roots in your heart, right? lest any poisonous root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Nelson Mandela said this. Can we quote Nelson Mandela? We can quote Nelson Mandela. Hallelujah. If you hate, you will give them your heart and mind. Don't give these two things away. Don't let someone else's sin control you. It's already done enough damage. 
So let's not let it control us. When we have a thorn of bitterness that gets in and it becomes undealt with, it now starts to grow inside of us and weaves into the very fabric of who we are and our identity. And pretty soon we now become wrapped up in something that isn't even who we are, but something that happened to us. Maybe it's ourselves that we need to forgive. Maybe we've been able to forgive others, but maybe there's some things in our life we haven't been able to forgive. Not forgiving ourselves is a subtle way of trying to compete with Christ's atonement. Think about it this way. God already punished Jesus for my sin, for your sin. He already punished him for it, right? He's already been punished for that sin, for my sin. So when we are punishing ourselves, we're trying to compete with Christ's finest hour. Which one of us who has a parent or has a kid (laughs) as a parent would discipline our kid for something they did only to find them later hurting themselves, inflicting pain on themselves for the sin that they were just disciplined for? As a parent, you would run to that. You would say, well, this isn't right. Stop, stop, stop. We just took care of that. It's, It's done. It's over, right? One of the things I like to say after discipline with our children is, all right, now, it's over. It is done. So after we leave this room, you now have one of two choices. Your choice can be to go on like everything's good because now it is. It's been taken care of. Or you can have the option of choosing to wallow and pout and be sad and have a pretty miserable rest of the day. But the choice is up to yours, whichever one you want, okay? We would look at that and say, no, 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 don't do that. Punishment's already been given. Same with us. What are some benefits? Freedom. Freedom. Peace. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that has evaded us for so long. Healing. Oh, how many times have we heard of not just inner healing happen when we release bitterness, but physical healing. Physical healing happens in our bodies when we're able to release forgiveness, joy. How do I forgive? Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. How do I forgive? Just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. One more time. How do I forgive? Just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. 